Alpha National Fraternity. I have been involved in Alpha Phi Omega since I pledged in spring 2001. And as I say this, it doesn't seem like a long time to me, but then people go, oh, I was born in spring 2001. I'm like, bless your heart. That's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> as region staff, I presented APO leads courses. I raised money for the fraternity. But outside of Alpha Phi Omega, I work at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and I work in technology. That's a field that doesn't often have a lot of uh, women representation or female representation. So diversity and equity is very close to my heart. I also do a lot of anti-racist uh, uh, seminars and facilitating workshops of that nature because I am very passionate about social justice efforts. So when this opportunity presented itself, I took the reins and I said, yes, this is something I definitely wanted to do. So I, that's enough about me for now. What I want to talk about today is diversity and inclusion. This is a round table. I've been doing kind of this presentation this whole week and last week. It will talk about what the program is doing at the national fraternity level, but also getting insight from what you're doing at your chapters so that we can utilize that to make the whole fraternity a better place. So there is a quote that you can see on the screen, and it says, diversity is having a seat at the table, inclusion is having a voice, and belonging is having that voice heard. So Liz Foslin, who is very, um, she does a lot of TED Talks, but she's known in the tech community because she does a lot of startup work with IT and women and technology in particular, is famous for this quote, but again, you may have heard it in different ways. And so one of the things that we're talking about at the fraternity is we want to make sure that our chapters feel included, not that they feel tokenized. So you don't want to just have people to say, check, we've done this. You want to make sure that they feel included. And so that's what the program, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, is trying to work on. So the first thing is I inherited an older strategic goal that didn't sit right with me and didn't sit right with a lot of people at the fraternity. What it originally said was we we're going to grow to 100% the number of chapters that reflect the demographic composition on their campuses. Now, back in the day, this might have been the way that people were trying to do diversity. And it came to 2020. I got pulled in around that time. And there had not been a lot of work on this goal, even though membership was working on things. And so I suggested that that goal be thrown out and we revise it. So this was presented to the board of directors that we would improve chapter climate by implementing supportive programs and initiatives so that chapters can really be open and inclusive and we would give them all the things they need so that they can get there. We would set benchmarks and we would do other things, but for the most part, it wasn't just about do we have the right people in our chapters, but if we do have diverse chapters, how can we make them feel like APO is a home? Because that's what most people, when they come and join the fraternity, that's why they stay, because they feel this sense of, I love Alpha Phi Omega. And when they're alums, they're like, I still love Alpha Phi Omega, but not, I love Alpha Phi Omega because we have a Black person and an Asian person. And that's not why they love Alpha Phi Omega. So I kind of aligned, this is the reason why we changed it. It doesn't align with higher education practices. It's very focused, and this will allow us to build that sense of community. I also think it is essential that it's a truly, if we have a truly diverse campus, we are going to need to learn from what people are already doing. So one of the first things that our program committee came up with was the climate survey tool. And you're like, yay, surveys. I want to take more surveys, Candace. That's exactly what I want to do. However, I felt it was very important because we need to hear from the students how their chapter environment works in order for us to get make it better or work on the things that the good chap the chapters that are doing it well so other chapters can do it. So this climate survey tool goes to all that pledge Alpha Phi Omega and stay in it. It's not just something that generally if you're an officer and you fill it out, your president fills out a CAPS form, or maybe the membership person fills it out the entire fraternity. This is an individual longitudinal survey that goes out to everyone. And it says, how welcoming was the chapter when I first joined? Do I get to have the ability to lead? Do I feel like I'm included? Do I feel like I've met people of a different gender or race or religion? So it's giving you this information and collecting it so that it can be confidential and shared with the chapters, but at the same time, it helps us as a fraternity know how are our chapters including people. Like, 
if they um, have people with physical disabilities, are their service projects aligned to make sure that their parking is uh, thought about? Or if they have people that are deaf and hard of hearing, how is their online environment inclusive? And so we don't have that information right now. So that's why this climate assessment survey is important that we get that information so that we can use it and help our chapters to go better. So I already created the survey. And as soon as I shared it with various groups as it's been shared out, everybody wants to add like 3,000 questions. So of course they're like, how about this one? And then the survey goes from 12 questions to 50 questions. And I said, no college student is going to take a 50 question survey annually. That's not gonna be helpful. So pare that back down, but that's one of the main things that we have been working on since um, the beginning of the year. I'll go into a little bit more of some definitions. I think this will be launching in the website sometime this spring, but there was no definition of what does Alpha Phi Omega think of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I actually wanted the program to be called equity, um, diversity, and belonging, but you know, equity is fi it's fine. So I said, if it's going to be called that, let's make sure we're defining it and we know what's happening. And so this will be approved by the board so that they we'll work on these definitions, but diversity is just that very broad definition that talks about all of the various class and affiliations. Equity is more about promoting justice and fairness through our procedures, through our processes, through the way that we're distributing those resources. And, you know, Alpha Phi Omega has to take onus that we had a lot of systemic issues in our fraternity that we need to be aware of so that we can make it better in the future. So we can't just push it under the rug. We have to say, you know, some of our policies and procedures were restrictive by, by gender or by age or by whatever it is, but having that self-awareness is a big, important piece. The other thing other than equity is inclusion. And this is the big piece where I've been working with membership. The membership committee is working on a friendship program. And I really feel that that diversity is not this flavor of the month that unfortunately has been coming up. And people are like, oh, we need our diversity. We need this. It has to be embedded and integrated in all the things we're doing. So I've been meeting with membership. I've been meeting with the friendship committee, the alumni, the advisory committee, all of these individuals need to be aware that this is what that definition looks like. Because even though it changes, if not everyone's included, it's it's kind of its own little program. It can't just be, oh, did you talk to the diversity person? The diversity person has to be included with all of the programming for the fraternity. Service, leadership, everything. So those are some definitions. So I talked about how do we, what are we doing? So the climate assessment survey is one of our big things. The next thing we're doing is we're talking about how do we get you access to the resources that you need. So my committee has been coming up with guides. So if you've ever thought, hmm, I wanna have this conversation, but I'm not sure how to start the conversation, we have a guide for you. So if you wanna talk about race or microaggressions or how to be an ally to various different groups as they identify, we have ways to start those conversations. Now, I don't wanna tell people how to have a conversation, but this is a guide that helps you facilitate that if you don't have the experience. Some institutions have wonderful cultural centers, they have wonderful uh, support areas, but all of our colleges and all of our universities do not. So this is a jumping point. We're not saying that you need to be the expert. This is not an expert. You are facilitating a dialogue and a discussion. And we want to build your confidence as a member of our fraternity to do that. And so some of the things we're going to be measuring is, do you have access to the resources? And do you feel you can confidently use and utilize those resources? So getting feedback for, is this the right type of thing that you're looking for? All of those things are what we're doing. We also want to work on recruitment and retention. Um, not just for a sake of numbers, but are you able to include these diversity and inclusion practices in a confident way that you feel like, yes, I know how, even though my chapters all, they all identify as women, I feel I can confidently go out there and recruit someone that does not look like me and make them feel like they belong and they could do great work at the fraternity. So these are some of the things that we're working on. So I'm gonna pause for a moment and bring a question up so that we can have more of a discussion. It's less of me talking to you and more of everyone sharing. 
And the thing I would like you to use in the chat, but actually it's a small enough group, it's only nine of us. So if you feel comfortable, just unmute yourself and we can talk back and forth. What's one thing that a chapter committed to diversity and inclusion, what should they be doing? Maggie, you have your hand raised. Um, yep, I, I was raised to do that. Um, a lot of it is just talk about it. It's a scary topic. It's an uncomfortable one. One of our goals should be to let ourselves be uncomfortable and just rather than walk around or on eggshells, just talk about it. We are not as diverse as we wanna be. How do we get there? and not single out like the people of color in there or the people with obvious diversities um, in there, but just open it up to everybody um, and make it not a taboo subject. Thank you, excellent response. Others, what, uh, what is your chapter doing? You raise your hand, go ahead. Hello everyone, it's Kachi Jogu um, from Alpha Iota's chapter at Ohio State. So I think in general for a chapter that's committed to diversity and inclusion for whatever identity it's about, I think that while Maggie said like I firmly agree that the conversation should be open to all members, people should be able to ask questions, but I think amplifying the voices of people from that identity and letting them at least control the conversation because I think that that way we can also avoid mis, um, microaggressions and any like miscommunications that could occur. And uh, as far as Alpha Iota's chapter, this year our membership vice president created two new positions in within our membership program, the inclusion vice chairs. So we have two of those and every, we have events probably like I would say at least on a weekly basis, depending on whatever is happening. If like for Women's History Month, we had a women in film series that we put on. Um, for this past Passover, we had a Jewish Brothers Roundtable where it was about five or six brothers in our chapter who are like of the Jew Jewish religion and a bunch of us just asking them like, what, what's your favorite holiday? What are some traditions you miss? Like, how do you connect with your Jewish community? And we have events like that throughout the year. As far as the um, chapter assessment, every at the start of each semester we have, like, I don't know if it's the same one connected through uh, your little committee in APO or your, your subcommittee in APO, but um, we have like an, a chapter assessment that we send out to bros. How do you feel about, you know, diversity inclusion in our chapter what can change what do you think works well and i think you know we we got as far as like our exec goes we uh, met this really head on especially early in the summer when uh, everything happened with george floyd and we had all the civil rights protests i think we were very proactive in letting the chapter know that we firmly stand for diversity and inclusion and equity and we amplify the voices of those who need amplification and I don't know I think we've done a great job of it so far and hopefully we can expand our effort, efforts in years to come. Kachi thank you for sharing I appreciate that um, when you mentioned amplifying those voices one of the things that I thought about because I was doing an ally workshop for uh, whenever Friday was I, I lose track of days um, for a women in technology group and one of the things that I always tell people is that they Unfortunately, sometimes people that are allies that aren't identifying as that subgroup that they're trying to ally for um, try to be a knight in shining armor versus trying, and they try to save the day versus trying to actually help that person. And so one of the things that I mentioned was an example, like there was someone trying to speak up in a meeting and the, the knight came and said, oh, you know, and kind of summarize whatever that person said and put it in their own words instead of passing it over to that person and letting them talk with their own voice. But the bigger thing that allyship is important of is that you want to actually change the system and try to help make it so that the systemic thing that's happening, which is people interrupting people during the meeting has changed. So an ally would go ahead and say, let's go back to what Maggie said, or let's go back to what Brittany said, but also let's implement a rule where we're not interrupting others. And so we're really trying to work on how can we change the system or the policies versus just pointing out, oh, I, I saved today, I helped. 
I shared what that person shared. And so I think that's a very important step that sometimes the fraternity, but larger than the fraternity is missing. So thank you for reminding me of that. Other things that chapters are doing, so I'm loving the, the dialogue, I'm loving the discussion. You also hosted the pronouns and genders of exclusion. Thank you so much. So I mentioned that because it's dear to my heart. I have been a Girl Scout troop leader for since they were in kindergarten and they're going into middle school now. And I have so many Scouts that identify as non-binary or something along that spectrum. And they, they speak up for themselves at a very young age and do these things. And so as, it, as you get to college age, you don't want to get to the point where you're, you feel very forced and stuck. And I think people are very still flexible and malleable and willing to change as long as they know what it is, like what that is. So one of the things that the committee, and I, I will say our committee has been doing a lot of work, but we have not been able to broadcast all the stuff that we're doing. So I appreciate the reach out to the region conferences is we've been working on kind of glossaries of term and terminology that it's not the end all be all of what you use. It's just allowing you to have a better language for how you speak to individuals if you don't know what to utilize. And so sometimes people aren't even aware of various different um, ways that people would like to be referred to and because they didn't ask. So if you don't ask, you won't be able to know, but there is a way to ask without making it feel like you're condescending or you're prying and other things. And so some people, they, they're like, uh, I, I'm going to go into story mode because I didn't see anything in the chat. So um, this is personal stories. I'm okay with sharing stories. And if you don't like them, well, you know, you know where the Zoom exit is. So one of the things that um, my, uh, my children are biracial because my husband is a APR brother. He's white and my kids are black and white, they, they, they identify as various things. But when they were young, they would show up to like parks, other things I bring them around, you know, grocery stores. And they would always go, what are you? And my children would respond with their name. Like, my name is this, or my name is this. They're like, no, no, no. Like, what, what, what are you? And then somebody would speak in Spanish or do something else. And, you know, they just wanted to kind of put them in a box. And the reason why I mentioned this is there's a way to have that conversation if people want to talk about, you know, gender, ethnicity versus making people feel less than or other. And sometimes it starts at a young age where you can have those conversations with people, but that's why we want to provide the resources. So people, it's okay to be awkward. I've always felt like, like awkward in my skin. However, there's a difference between being awkward and ignorant. So you don't want to get to the point where you feel like, um, the other person has to prove themselves to you when they're having a conversation. And so that's why we're coming up with these guides so people can embrace their awkwardness, but not feel like they're on the other side. So I'm seeing some nods of heads. I want people to be able to ask the question, but ask it in a way that they don't feel like they're always putting their foot in their mouth. Worst thing that happens is Miss Frizzle, I'm sure people might know who Miss Frizzle is, um, that quote where she says, take chances, make mistakes, you know, get messy. That is a truism, if anything. However, if you make a mistake, because people are going to make mistakes, apologize. I mean, truly apologize and mean it, and then learn from it. That's how we get better. So if you make a mistake, let's say you misgender someone, or let's say you mispronounce a name, you can apologize and learn from it versus going into like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. And then don't get defensive. If they were in, if they were upset or if they were, they felt offended by it, that's their feelings. They can feel offended. You don't have to then justify and be like, oh, but I meant this. You're taking it the wrong way. They can take it the way that they want to take it because that is, that's their prerogative. So those are just my own thoughts. But um, other things that chapters that are committed to diversity and inclusion, what should they be doing? So less Candace stories, more about what you as a chapter are doing. So putting on my, my chapter advisor or region chair hat, I feel, um, and some of our chapters have already been in the midst of doing this for the last few months, that if this really wants to be a focus of your chapter's operations or you want to create a program on the chapter level for it, which I think is a phenomenal idea, I think you should open it up to a chapter bylaw discussion or putting a position into your chapter operation to oversee it so that it's not just an idea or a concept that you all are talking about for the semester or for this year. Um, 
Like, I don't want this to be something that's like Candace said, a flavor of the month that we're talking about it now. And then it gets dropped next semester because the next group of students isn't really focused on that. If it's something that's really important to your chapter and you want to make your chapter an open and inclusive and have that sense of belonging, and that's a true importance of your chapter's active brotherhood, then put it into your bylaws, have a position or a chair or an existing VP oversee this type of program so that it's ingrained in your chapter operations. And every year it will continue to be a focus long after we are all associated with the chapters. And that I think, especially for our graduating seniors, um, is a way to kind of cement that being an importance and that that is going to continue long after you are gone and you've made your contributions that you can make as an active. I think that's the one way to kind of safeguard that the chapter won't lose focus on this in the future and it won't just be a passing fad that they're caring about now, but it needs to be something ongoing that it's worked on every single semester as people grow and change and, and campuses change so that they can continue to address things that are relevant to, to current events. Thank you. And I know we're still showing the same question, which is chapters that are committed to diversity and inclusion, what should they do? The reason why um, I'm applauding everyone and thanking everyone for their suggestions is because if you think that's something that you should be doing or that your chapter is doing, when they hear that, other chapters that are on the call or however this is being shared, they'll go, oh, I didn't even think we that's something we could do. So that's why I'm dragging this out, just to allow everyone to participate and share because the more that they share versus me just giving examples of things. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off by unmuting like that. But um, while we were having the discussion and everyone else was sharing, I remembered another event that we put on this semester that I was so glad to attend. It was the Cultural Competency BLB. So the event coordinator and the host was one of our, so BLB is Brothers Leading Brothers. Our BLB vice chair hosted this. She'd take, I don't know if it was a class or just a course she, she had taken on cultural, B, uh, cultural competency. And even though her identity was white, I think she was, she's white Hispanic, the floor was mainly for um, people of immigrant identities, which I am. I'm I'm an immigrant. I moved here from Nigeria in 2015. And we have a lot of bros in our chapter who are also immigrants and have all kinds of like backgrounds from all around the world. It's a really beautiful thing about having such a big chapter. And I think that the conversation flowed really, really nicely. Um, we had a lot of white bros on the call and like we were just able to talk about our experiences in the US and talk about how, you know, we found unity amongst ourselves as people of color and like how that is like a community for us too and we also it was a good forum for us to like address questions that brothers have because for me people always wonder like how do you say your name and <laughs> and we, you know we also talked about microaggressions that we faced and one that I even as an immigrant didn't really notice that was as big of a problem like people ask me all the time especially when they see my name like oh like where are you from or I don't typically get the what are you question even though it is like I don't think anybody should be asking that like we're human but um a brother who is American Indian her parents were the ones who immigrated from India to the U.S. was asked like where are you from and she was born in Dublin Ohio she's like I'm very much from Ohio so I didn't realize that because when people ask me where are you from I'm like well I'm from Nigeria that's where I was born I lived there for 15 years so like that's an okay question for me as an immigrant but there are some people who are true Americans that were born here and everything who still receive that question and it's like it can be very marginalizing so I feel like events like this have definitely helped our chapter address diversity inclusion and be very um what's the word I'm looking for very proactive about it for sure and very not just like just giving a statement every once in a while like we've had these difficult conversations I think it's very much helped. Thank you for sharing. Maggie you have your hand raised. I do. I actually have a question, and not to put you uh, on the spot um, in any way, Kachi, but um, because I could see myself, you know, seeing your name, and I remember I, I did ask you how to pronounce, and, and to me, that wasn't certainly an attempt to marginalize. It was actually an attempt to be respectful, because I think everybody's name is important, and the reality is that mine is less likely in this country to be mispronounced because people are familiar with it. I could also see me, you know, being curious and saying, you know, 
sounds like maybe you weren't born in this country. You know, where are you from? Out of curiosity, is that offensive or is the is the point of it what you do next? Because the the second part of that would be, oh, that's fascinating. Taking it as a positive, because I think it is. Wow, what was that like? Share some of your experience. Does that make it okay? I, I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this well, because I do want to be respectful um, at all times, but I also don't want to pretend I don't see what your name is. I don't hear what it is and act like you said Jane Smith and there aren't some potential follow-up questions. So talk to me. No, I completely understand. Um, and I think that a lot of people come from a place of genuine like curiosity and appreciation, but sometimes it could be like, I don't know, like there's some Nigerians who were born here. So I guess maybe like saying like, where's your name from? You know, because you don't know if like, because I mean, I could have been born here. You don't really, I've, I always say, could teach a class in assimilation. My Nigerian accent is completely concealed. Not that assimilation is the goal for immigrants, but I just got tired of repeating myself. <laughs> um, but I think that asking more like phrasing it like, oh, where's your name from might be good. And people like, I genuinely love talking about my experience as an immigrant, what it was like growing up in Nigeria, what my name means and things like that. I think it's very, I don't get offended when people ask what does offend me sometimes, especially when my full name is spelled out. My full first name is Oyakachi and my last name is actually hyphenated. So I know this happens almost every week when I go to get COVID tested at the school, it's mandated and they, they uh, print out your name on a thing that goes on the test tube and every single person is like, oh wow, that's a long name. And I'm like, okay like what am I what am I supposed to say to that or people sometimes like they're just like oh I'm not even gonna try and say that which is like I understand that you're not trying to offend me but it's also like I don't know like you could also just ask how do you say that instead of being like well that's too long I'm not gonna try I don't know it's like I don't know it's not the nicest feeling but I also know that it doesn't always come from a place of malice and anyone necessarily trying to be hurtful but I think it's just something to consider but I completely I appreciate you for asking me to clarify. Thanks, I appreciate everyone and asking all the questions. I will say that um, in the chat, we there was a sharing of looking into actual resources on the campus and having chapters look into that. So that's there. One of the things that the committee has suggested and not because we wanted it to be performative, but because we want to let people know what the chapter is already doing is suggesting adding diversity and equity um, requirements into the PPOE and COE because there are um, ex the PPOE is the pledge program of excellence and the COE is the chapter of excellence programs. They already exist and they're supposed to be showing how we're excellent in each chapter. And so making sure that there are requirements that say, are you doing any programming towards diversity and inclusion? But at the same time, that should have probably already been in there, but it was not. So we made those suggestions, but having an actual annual award that acknowledges and recognizes those that are doing this great work. So during this last year, there have been some chapters doing wonderful social justice efforts or wonderful inclusion efforts. And how do we recognize those the same way that we recognize those that are doing service work um, and service with our service partners? So how can we amplify those voices? And so we put in a request to have that added as an annual award. So that's, again, lots of work that's coming. I appreciate everyone in terms of sharing. Did anybody else wanna share before I move to another question and then just open Q&A? Seeing none of me. Go yeah. ahead. I'm so sorry, but I just wanted to say that I have to leave for my exec meeting now. But this has been amazing. I plan to stay connected to you all, and this will be recorded, so I'll go watch the recording for what I've missed. But um, thank you so much for this, Candice, and it was really nice hearing from everyone. Have a good, have a good evening. Bye. Thank bye. you so much for joining. I appreciate it. I will go ahead and move on to the next question. Again, at any point, feel free to use the chat or unmute yourself. But what is the biggest challenge that you face when you've been trying to improve diversity or inclusion efforts at your chapter? And if you don't have a specific example, you can do a hypothetical, you know, oh, I was thinking about this. However, this is what 
I had to overcome or what I'm thinking about overcoming. So what are some of those challenges? I might have missed something in the chat. Um, Sean used the chat and said, one of the things that Theta Epsilon, Epsilon chapter does is having brothers present passion projects. Oh, allowing them to speak on something that they love and enjoy and allow brothers to learn from them. Thank you for sharing on the previous question about that. Thanks. Do let me know if you want to elaborate on that. So I can start with a challenge um, and maybe that'll get the juices flowing and people can determine uh, what challenges chapters might face. One thing that I found, yes, it is hard to avoid tokenism. Thank you, Maggie, for using it in the chat, is sometimes there can be a burnout. So, I mean, I'm very passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion. However, I'm not the spokesman for all, all women. I'm not the spokesman for all Black people. I'm not the spokesman for all Black women. Um, so when someone says, hey, what do you think about this? I was like, I could tell you what I think, but I, again, am not speaking on behalf of my entire race. And so sometimes at the university, you know, you get put on a couple committees and then you get put on some task force and action force. And next thing you know, all you're doing is speaking on your your experiences, which is great because now your voice is being heard, you feel included. But at the same time, you need to remember to, it's a challenge because you need to remember to get that support. So how do you still have some time to self-care and work with other affinity groups and kind of recharge your own batteries. And so it's it's great to be able to do that work, but it helps when you can build up a team of individuals that are going to be doing that work alongside you. And so the challenge for me is to make sure to always seek out, you know, that that wonderful person that was speaking in my uh, one of the workshops that I did or grabbing other people along, building them up so that there is no, there's not burnout, but rather you can spread the load. And so I think it's been a challenge to build that pipeline, primarily because you build it out of seeing individuals and versus um, just having everyone know all the information. So that's been a challenge for me when I've been trying to help improve diversity. I feel like kind of doing it all by yourself. And so it's been a challenge, but at the same time, I welcome the challenge and I keep seeking out more people that would love to do this work and being able to share this as the diversity, equity and inclusion chair, I've been able to find people all across the country willing to do this work and willing to learn about how to do this work. And that's what I appreciate. Maggie also shared in the chat, it's tough, also tough to be sensitive without always walking on eggshells. I agree. I know people that, from my experience, have not want to put their foot in their mouth. So they're like, I want to say this. However, can I say that? Is it still okay to say this? And what's going to happen if I say this? Am I going to be canceled? Question mark. Um, so I tell people, when it comes from the heart and when it comes from something like your authentic self and people can see that they know that you're trying to learn and trying to be better versus just trying to prove like, Hey, I'm doing this. And so that also helps a lot more when it's face to face or in person or video versus when you're doing things online, it is very hard to read some of the context behind how people are speaking in written communication. So I tell people sarcasm does not translate well via email. You know, you might have to put a meme in there or something in order for them to understand that you were meaning what you were there. But I will say, um, it is a delicate situation, but you can do that. Let's see. I also agree. Sometimes I don't know what I can ask out of curiosity without offending someone. I, I, I Sarah, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate you saying that. I want to implore everyone to remember that an ally or someone that's learning has to be bold sometimes, and you have to be able to make those mistakes and ask those questions because even though it might feel awkward or it might feel like, oh my goodness, I said the wrong thing. The person generally will allow you to make those mistakes if you have a nice welcoming environment. So generally the chapter is the way, the place to make those mistakes versus like waiting until you get into a working environment or a different environment. This is the place to make those mistakes because they can be addressed. I don't want people to feel like they're gonna ruin a, a friendship because of what they say. 
Oh, you have a hand raised. Eileen, you have your hand raised? Oh, I was going to speak after you were done. So oh, okay. Well, the I was wrapping up, but what I was saying is there is a way to mend some of those friendships. Um, even if you ask a question that is offensive to a person, when you can have that dialogue with maybe it's moderated by somebody else, maybe it's not, you can um, work to kind of, if, even, even if you did put your foot in the mouth, if you apologize in the right way, you can move forward and have wonderful friendships that have started from uh, some really or awkward comments. So I'll let you go and then I can give a more descriptive response if for some reason that it makes sense to others. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add a little bit about like, um, cause I've, I've personally, because of my name have been asked a lot of the, those like, where are you from questions. Um, and I think a lot of times um, where I feel most uncomfortable being asked those questions is like in public um, when I feel like singled out um, and like, uh, I don't know like how to respond without like, cause I don't, I know, I know like, um, like was mentioned before, most of these things are not coming out of like malice. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not here to like, I don't want to like spend time like, um, you know, correcting a stranger when like um, in public and like, uh, just like, I kind of like a lot of those times, like in public, I just like want to ignore it and just be like, oh, like um, I'm from, I was born and raised in America and just kind of like leave it at that. But um, if like, I think like if you like want to ask those questions I, I think it's much better or at least in my experience to like ask them like personally and not like um not in a space where they feel like singled out um so like if, if you just send them like a private like message um uh like that conversation can can happen more authentically and um and that person can explain themselves more because they're um like they have time to like really think about how they want to explain it to you and like um how to yeah um but like I don't know if someone like makes it clear like um if, if you do like ask them in public and they make it clear that they don't want to talk about it I wouldn't like you know, pry and like try to try to have a personal conversation when they already made it clear in public that they didn't want to talk about it. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think, I think a private conversation is a little bit like makes a little bit more room for them to feel a little bit uh, like safer and um, able to really uh, articulate what they um, want to say to you. So. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. And I, I agree. And the situation will vary, but yeah, definitely it allows them to have a safe space to share that about. The only thing that I will say is that in terms of feeling awkward or not knowing what to say is if you generally genuinely care about learning more, that is different than just trying to classify something. So sometimes people are just trying to be like, I don't know in my head where this is going. Let me ask this question so I can put it in a box versus genuinely trying to know more about a person, which I feel is different. So let's say somebody is coming to a training about, you know, I want to have more women in the workplace for this. And they're like, hey, how do we do this? You're a woman, tell me. And unless there's like the, the need to actually learn how to do that and really like, this is how we're going to work towards it and build a relationship. I, I, it feels like, why am I even telling you this? You're not going to be moving this towards anything. So it doesn't seem like it's worth my time to invest and share all of these insights if you're not going to use it or if you don't care what my thoughts are. But I think that at the chapter level, they will be well received. Nina, would you like to uh, me to read out what you shared in the chat? Okay, Nina shared as an early childhood inter intervention specialist, a special ed teacher, I see a lack of person first language, which is a way to see others as an equal and not putting a label on them. So thank you for sharing Nina in the chat. 
Are there other challenges that people have faced when they've been trying to improve diversity and inclusion efforts in their chapter that they would like to discuss as a group before I move to open Q&A? Maggie. Is, I know I'm saying a lot. If it's too much, you let me know. Is it all right if I tell a little story? Go ahead. I definitely can soft shoe, but I love for you to tell a story. Okay. We learn from experiences. All right. Yeah. Uh, I want to highlight a point that you actually already made well, but, um, and that is the be willing to make mistakes. It's okay. I was doing actually a workshop on diversity in Alpha Phi Omega. And anyone who knows me knows I use a lot of, well, what I consider humor, whether y'all find it funny or not, is another story. But I use that quite a lot. And I don't fit well into uh, my, my stereotypes and um, been a tomboy my whole life, whatever. Growing up, swear to God, my parents used to say, we have three kids, one of each. And it was my brother, my sister, and then me. So I've been using that phrasing my entire life, never meant anything offensive to anybody by it, but the world changed around me. And I was at this session and I made some reference to the fact that I think it's the state of, of Massachusetts has like 31 different classifications for gender. And I made some flip comment like I'm inclined to do, anyone who knows me knows, and people like Candace who've known me for years, probably wouldn't would know that I'm not meaning to be offensive, but I don't always have a Candace in the room with me. And so I think the comment I made was, you know, something like, in my day, it was boy, girl, and other, and that was it. And then I went on with whatever. Later on in the session, one of the brothers identified themselves as being non-binary. And all of a sudden, when they said that, I kind of did a rewind of what I had said and how it probably was heard. And when they got done, I immediately stopped what I was doing and said, I owe you an apology. I just realized what I said before. I meant nothing by it, but I totally understand how it must have been heard. And I screwed up. And I am really, really sorry. And what was interesting, it was, it was hard for me, but I knew it was the right thing to do. It was embarrassing, but the response of the brother was one of absolute shock. And they looked at me and said, my God, nobody ever apologizes. So they were willing to focus on the apology and they could tell that I was sincere in it rather than the mistake it brought up a little bit of a conversation, which I thought was healthy. It has changed the way I speak and how I present. And I actually tell this story a lot during my sessions because I want to kind of point out that even somebody who was, I was there to talk about diversity and I screwed it up royally. And that person stayed, not only was I, I mean, I could tell I was genuinely forgiven, because they, you know, participated for the rest of the session, came to another session I did, was sitting there doing origami the whole time and actually gave me the origami piece that they were working on. I had them write their name on it because I never want to forget. Uh, their name was Hanny. And I never want to forget that because that was a real learning opportunity for me. And it's, one of those things where I made a mistake, I'm sorry about the mistake, but I gained more. I think they felt even more seen and accepted after the conversation. So the net outcome was a positive one, but it's okay to make mistakes no matter what. And, and said, am I embarrassed that I made that mistake? Absolutely. But, um, it's going to happen no matter what your intents are, you're going to screw up. And in my case, it's not an excuse. I'm old. This stuff didn't, when I started saying this stuff, nobody knew about, I'm sure there were non-binary people, but none of us knew what the hell that meant. 
and none of us allowed for it. And my language, I didn't realize I hadn't updated it. It's updated. I haven't made that mistake since. And hopefully I never will again. And, and hopefully my experience um, uh, helps sort of frame other people as well. Now I'm rambling. Sorry. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Maggie, for sharing. I see that Sarah also shared in the chat. Thank you for sharing. It Thanks, is Sarah. important that you um, share those experiences because this is how we learn. And so again, make mistakes, but as long as we're learning from them, that's the important part. Um, so were there other general questions that people had before I end up wrapping up with our last part of Q&A? So this is additional questions that people have. I'll put my email in the chat as well. I have a lot of email addresses, but you can use, they all go to the same spot. And I will stop sharing my screen and just look at people since there's no content on these slides and other questions that people have. Candice, because I know a lot of our students and volunteers will be watching this recording after the fact, are there going to be new resources, I'm assuming, and material available this summer, this fall for chapters who are working on starting these types of programs for DEI? Yes, and so right now, I've been working with, um, so my liaison is Bob London and uh, at the national office. And there are things that I'm telling, I'm re reminding them not to wait until everything's ready and to continue to push things out continuously. So some people may be familiar with the IAT, it's the implicit, um, implicit bias association test. There is um, other programs that we're talking about in terms of diversity, self-awareness, there's a cultural competency program, then there's an anti-racism program. So there's different pockets. So think about like APO leads, you know how you have all those courses of leadership. There are courses and workshops that are available and coming, but before the workshops get there, we have things like a glossary of terms so that our alumni or even our students know about all these new terminologies so that they don't find themselves making a lot of mistakes that can be avoided if they can bring there. So yes, we will be rolling things out continuously. It's just more of a, what does the timeline look like? It will be the spring, the summer, through the fall. As soon as they get branded with the APO brand and the national office works on them, they will continue to be um, pushed out. They'll be pushed out through the website. We'll be pushing them out through the region chairs, through our section chairs through our chapter officers, but we want to make sure that there's a, a large campaign so people know that it's forthcoming. So yes, the resources will be available. And that is that. Perfect, thank you. Does anyone else have questions about what the committee, the program's doing, or just questions in general that would help at the chapter. Maybe you want to ask each other. Maybe you want to ask me. I'm here, and I'm told that I'm good at answering questions. I have a quick question. So um, our chapter is like a relatively small chapter, um, and so we already, I guess, like have a pretty difficult time, like, recruiting members, new members in general. Um, so like you mentioned recruiting like members um, who don't necessarily look like um, the like uh, I guess the the normal I, I don't I don't know the like current membership yeah yeah um in APO so um I guess so one thing like we discussed when we were like talking about on um, this semester's fresh that we didn't end up going um going for it was like a um like an around the world like type of rush theme. Um, um, but there were concerns about, you know, um, exclude, excluding certain um, cultures and um, and then like, obviously like, um, like how to, how to conduct it in a way that um, it makes like people feel included and not like, um, not like offended or anything. Uh, so, yeah, I guess like what what are some ways you would suggest like a especially a smaller chapter um, to like recruit um, more diversity? I guess. So excellent question. Thank you for asking. 
One of the things I would think is to try not to do it all alone by asking for support and resources and aligning, maybe partnering with another group, whether it be another student group or maybe it's a cultural center group where you can host an event where you're using it as recruitment, but they're using it as presenting the content about that culture or that experience. And so maybe you partner with, you know, one or two different groups to have different, maybe it's a fellowship event, maybe it's a leadership workshop, but they're presenting the content in their own way, talking about their culture and how it's there. And then you're there recruiting, saying, you know, we would love to have you also do the service project with us or to have a joint type effort. So you're always recruiting, even if it's not during the formal time of recruiting. So partnering with them to bring in their insight and they're their own organization, but then also sharing, wouldn't it be great if we went and did this project together? And at that point now, they feel like they're included and they're part of the process. And so I would say that although it's great to try to say, yes, let's involve all of this, see the people that are already doing it and ask them to help you do that because they can still see benefit of giving that um, education to others. And it won't seem as burdensome if you're partnering together to actually do an event. So that's one suggestion. It's not the only suggestion, but that would be my first is to identify where are those groups that I can partner with that can help me do this work. Does anyone else have um, suggestions for Eileen that they would like to share? I'm never one to be shy. When I uh, do workshops on recruiting for diversity, once you get them in the room, one of the things I've always said, and, and Candace, uh, get to build on what you said is basically when you walk into a room and nobody looks like you, it's hard to stay in that room. That's just reality. So you want someone in every room to that, that, that anybody who comes in is going to be comfortable. Well, how do you get there when you're not yet there? It becomes this cycle thing. It's actually, this may sound like an oversimplification, but it is kind of easy if you can get to that person and form some sort of a connection with them before they kind of click that nobody looks like them, then they focus on what they have in common. And for example, Aileen, can you tell me, um, what's your favorite service project that you've ever done? It's a real question. I'm putting you on the spot. Thank you. Oh, um... This is actually not connected to APO, but I really like, uh, I've, re I've recently started like uh, serving dinner at um, our local transition transition home, so. What kind of transition? Uh, um, it's it's like people who don't have housing. Oh, okay, but, from home. That are given too. free housing, yeah. That is outstanding. I have recently with the pandemic really heavily gotten into the food insecurity stuff because it is such a big issue. Whatever differences you and I have, I'm way older, grew up, well, actually, I, I grew up in a whole different place. I grew up in New Jersey, so that's a whole different world. So whatever we have that's different, hopefully by bringing up the service project and getting, now the focus is on what we have in common. And that is the key. And in APO, we can totally cheat because you can, I, I didn't have to think what question to ask you. If I ask anybody with any APO contact for a favorite service project, I'm going to get an answer. And next time we see each other, what we're going to focus on is that service project and what we now have in common. So if you can replace what's different and what makes me want to not stay in the room um, with something in common that is going to make me feel comfortable in the room, uh, I think that's going to have a huge effect on uh, recruitment. That is something, that is my biggest suggestion. You still got to get them in the room. And like, you know, Candace's suggestion, there's a whole lot of other uh, things to do. But once they're there, make them feel like they want to stay. Okay, off my soapbox. Thank you, May. Yeah. No, building relationships, that's one of the initiate inquire, but inquiring and finding the common ground is the definite way to build that relationship and retain the, the people that you do get to show up to a rush event or any type of event. So thank you, Maggie, for sharing. 
I believe we have maybe two or three minutes remaining. Are there any other questions that people would like to ask? I, I could share one final story or we could people are thumbs up. They're like, we love all the candy stories or they don't, it's okay. I've, I've been collecting them now that I'm, you know, nice and seasoned. I've been around for a while. I've got. I still got APO t-shirts older than you, Candace, just so you know, baby. <laughs> Thank you. At least it makes me feel young at heart. Uh, yes, I will. I'll go ahead. Um, so uh, one, the one story I'll share, which is, this is more about um, feeling like kind of belonging. And one of the things that really stuck me is when I, um, I mentioned this in terms of my background as I work in technology is I started off and I, I wanted to switch. I wanted to leave because I was like, this is ridiculous. Like I go into engineering class, there's nobody that looks like me. There's, I come up and talk to an instructor and the instructor's like, uh, are you in the wrong room? And I'm like, no, I've been in your class this whole time. Like, what are you talking about? I'm sitting here. We go to group work and they would be like, oh my God, I don't want to partner with her. Like, and I would hear them visibly say this. And then sometimes it would go, they would, one person said, mm, maybe I do want to partner with you. I've never been with a black chick before. And as this happened, I was like, I need to get out of engineering. This is a toxic environment. But Instead, I said, Candace, buckle down. You can do this. You love yourself. Don't let other people define you. You can do this. So I like, had to get on my like wonderful soapbox of like, love yourself, watch all these things. And then I started a group of like finding all of the people that had a affinity group. So a group of people that I could connect with so that we could all talk about these same experiences. And we started our own group in engineering to kind of fight the fight. Um, but it allowed me to one, feel like I had a place where I could belong. But at some point, we opened that group up to those that didn't look like us so we could share with our experiences so that they could pass that on to the people that were isolating us. So we started to say, you know, now that we've built a strong team and we feel great, let's bring in those people that made us feel othered and let them know how we feel so that they can now share that with other people before other people get isolated. And so I love when I come back to the College of Engineering or various other places, letting them know how some of those large lecture halls and other things aren't really welcoming, but how it can turn people the other direction. And so making sure that they have those supports already built in so it doesn't take a freshman or a sophomore building a group to feel supported to stay in the college, but it's coming from the top down, the bottom, all over so that you can actually let those people flourish. And so with that, that is the final question, um, the final statement and story that I will say, love yourself, don't let other people define you, and all of those good things. You probably already heard all these quotes. Um, it's just my personal experience of the same thing that you've already heard, but you know, it's all good. Thank you so much for joining us, Candace. I'm super excited to see the materials come out this year, and I think our students are really excited and our volunteers to have support in this realm because I think our students are super passionate about it. Thanks again. Thanks everyone. Enjoy your Sunday. I did remember it's Sunday. <laughs> Thank it you. Awesome. Thanks so much.